you go into, anybody like all you eat buffets? Yes. <laughs> I don't like my food. It's an American thing. Imagine you were <laughs> going to the soup plantation or something like that, and you're, you're going down and uh, you see different meats and different vegetables, and then you come to this tray of kind of a, a greenish brown kind of mush stuff. And so you ask the person, hey, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, that's our pre-chewed food. Forget uh, <laughs> about it. So, yeah, so some of our clients don't like to put the effort into chewing their own food, and so we have people come in every morning and they take a well-balanced meal, and they put it in their mouth, and they chew it all up and spit it back out, so that all you have to do is come in and swallow it. And it's a fully nutritious, the easiest meal you'll ever eat. Right? Anybody interested in something like that? <laughs> But isn't that how we treat, isn't that how we treat God's word? We want someone to come and pre-chew it for us and just spit it out so we can swallow it. Mm -hmm. We never learn how to chew for ourselves. That's why we're listening to you. So today I'm not gonna pre I'm not gonna pre-chew anything for you. I'm gonna have you chew this book up yourself so that you own it. So that you will actually, and this is, we're going to spend the whole year learning how to do this. So every book I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach you four different books of the Bible, entire books of the Bible, uh, over the course of the next nine months. Uh, and you will know, I guarantee at the end of it, at the end of this nine months, you will be able to open any book of the Bible and understand it for yourself. To the point where you could teach it all the principles to someone else with absolute integrity and confidence, not having looked at a single commentary. Wow. Okay, that's my guarantee to you. Uh, and so we're going to start with uh, the four steps of inductive Bible study. Four steps of inductive Bible study. Uh, the first step, step one, is make observation. Make observations. When, uh, a couple years ago, uh, right as COVID was the first wave of COVID, you know, it kind of comes in waves, the first wave was decreasing. Uh, I saw online some tickets for Hawaii for uh, $190 each round trip. And so I booked a trip for my family at my even if they close, well, you know, it's not that much of a loss. Uh, and so we went and we said there was nothing you could do because every every restaurant, every thing, I think we're at the one hotel that was open, everything was closed. So we decided we'd go scuba diving, right? Because there's no mask man. You're wearing a mask underwater, so you're complying with the mask mandate. And uh, so we got, we got scuba certified as a family. And our, our instructor, a guy named Alex, would be swimming, we'd be scubaing along, and he'd go, oh, and he'd like point at stuff, and I'm like, what? I don't see it. Right? And then he'd reach his hand in and he'd pull out an octopus and he'd stick it to his face and wrap around it. He's just a really fun guy. But it was amazing how he could see things so easily. Right? He just, he swung along, he's like, oh, look, there's a eel, there's an octopus, there's a blowfish, there's a, you know, and he could see, he could, read, just, he could see it all effortlessly. I want to teach you how to see the important stuff in Scripture effortlessly. Right? He didn't have better eyesight than we did, he just knew what to look for. Mm. Most people don't understand scripture because they don't know what to look for. So, first thing, I'm just going to give you a couple things. There's about 12 things over the course of the year that you're going to get trained to see. So this is going to alter your whole experience with the Bible. Being Understanding what to look for. It is going to help you to see all the insights, all the nuggets, all the things that when people say them, you go, wow, I never saw that. I'm going to teach you how to see it, right? So 
I'm just going to go over a couple today. The first one is repetition. Repetition. Say repetition. Repetition. Say it three times. Repetition. Repetition. And so the, 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 the very first thing you want to do when you make observations is to look for repetitions. Okay? You want to look for repetitions. Where do we want to look for repetitions? What makes a repetition significant? Not just who said it. Why was that the problem? Where? Yeah. Where? Okay. Where? Right. So uh, you can you can have one word repeated ten times in one paragraph, or you can have a one word repeated in ten paragraphs. Which one's more significant? The one that's in more paragraphs, right? So you want to look for repetitions in multiple paragraphs. You have six paragraphs on this manuscript. When I, when I give you an opportunity to go look for repetitions, look for the ones that occur in more than one paragraph. That is going to give you an indication that it's more, it's a more significant repetition. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So it's not just the number of times that it repeats, but how many times does it repeat in different paragraphs? That makes sense? Yeah. Right? This is a really short book, uh, but it's when we go through like Mark, the Gospel of Mark, or we go through Romans, or we go through Ephesians, or we go through Galatians, any one of these books, they're much longer books. And you'll have some repetitions that span the entire book. And that starts to give you an indicator, wow, this is one of the author's main ideas. That make sense? Okay, so first thing we want to look for is repetitions. Second thing we want to look for are, well, not just repetitions, not just same words, but similar words. Okay? So, uh, like anger, wrath, rage, they're different words, right? But they're similar words, and so they carry the same idea. Second thing you want to look for is what, well, for today, in this book, you want to look for what we call causations. Causation. Say causation. Causation. Right? So a causation is simply a cause that produces an effect, right? So a cause that produces an effect. How do you see causations? Well, language is a wonderful thing, and a lot of these, what we, the, what we call structural laws that all writers use, uh, they have what we call flag words. It's like a big flag sticking up in the middle of the text that says, look, I'm a causation. Look, I'm a causation. Right? And so write this down. Some of the flag words you want to look for for causations are the word therefore, so, and then. Right? So if I said, I'm hungry, therefore I'm going to in and out, what is that? A causation. What's the cause? I'm hungry. Therefore, what's the effect? I'm going to go get something to eat. That makes sense? Right? Now I could say it the same way. I'm hungry, so I'm going to in and out. Yeah. So is the same thing as a flag word. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay? Alright, so, uh, and then contrast. Say contrast. 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 And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving you the things that are actually in this book. So that when you go look, you're not looking for stuff that's not there. Uh, contrast is just two things that are being set in opposition to each other, right? The flag word, and the flag word usually occurs in the middle of it, right? So a causation that therefore is between the cause and the effect. That makes sense? So you've got to, when you see a therefore, you have to look in front of the therefore to know the cause, after the therefore to find the effect. In a contrast, the, the flag word that's most often used is but, right? But, and it's going to be on. But it's like a fulcrum in the middle of two balanced things. 
right? So the but is going to be balancing between two opposing ideas. That make sense? Okay. All right. So any questions about that? I know you're already all digging in. You're like, I want to see it. I want to see it. <laughs> all right. Let's let's look for some repetition. And let's make just because just for time sake. Uh, one, so this is mine, right? I just did this about 10 minutes before the class, right? So that's all it takes. It doesn't take long to do all your observations. Uh, it'll take you a little bit longer now because it's the first time you're doing it maybe, uh, but once you do it on a regular basis, it's just easy. You just see it. Okay, oh, I forgot to tell you something. When, just to help it make it easy for you, for a causation, I always put a symbol like that in the margin next to it, okay? And that tells me that I've got a cause leading me to an effect. Causations are where the majority of your application is. Just, right, just pull extra added bonus material. For a, a contrast, I just do a little C with a circle around it. For repetitions, I just circle the words. Right? If it's a similar word, I might just underline it. Okay? So what words do you see repeating here? Jesus. Jesus, great. Everybody see Jesus. Christ. Christ. Excellent. What, what, what else goes with Jesus and Christ? Uh, Lord. Lord, right? You're going to see Lord a lot. This is actually the most repeated word in the entire book. This combination of Jesus, Christ, and Lord. It's all referring to the same person, right? So they're all similar words. Right? Christ is there eight times. Jesus is there six times. Lord is there six times. Just so you make sure you get them all. How many paragraphs did it show up in? All of them. How significant is this? Okay, so when we realize, okay, this is a significant thought here in the book of Philemon. Right? Now I want you to realize something. We've got, we already have an insight and we haven't even read the book. Isn't that fascinating? In fact, I used to tell my, and I'll tell you, when uh, we're going through it through the semester, I'm going to tell you to stop reading the Bible. You've got to stop reading it because it hinders your ability to make observations. When we're reading, we're trying to find meaning. I don't want you to find any meaning yet. I just want you to make observations. The meaning will come when we put the pieces together, right? We haven't built enough yet. What are some other words that you see? Lord. Right, so we've got Christ, Jesus, and Lord. Prisoner. Prisoner, good. What goes with prisoner? Slave. Uh, yeah, you can probably, there's a better one than slave. Chains. In chains, right? In chains. Exact same thought as a prisoner. Slave is kind of a different word, and it only shows up once. Or twice in one paragraph, right? So it's not a significant idea for us initially. And, and I want you to be careful. Once you start doing this, you can really get lost in the weeds. Right? You really get lost in the weeds. And I don't want you to do that. We're looking for the easy stuff. Most insight in Scripture is obvious. All the best and mind-blowing insights are right on the surface. So, for example, if I went and we took, I don't know, $10,000 in $100 bills and scattered it all over the patio, and I said, hey guys, there's money out there if you want to go get it. 
How many of you would go to Home Depot and rent a jackhammer and start jacking up? <laughs> Anyone? No, what would you do? Go get the easy stuff. That's scripture. Most of the valuable stuff's right on the surface. You don't need a seminary degree. You don't need to jackhammer into the degree to figure it all out. There's a great insight right on the surface if you know where to look. Good, brother. Brother. Anybody see brother? Yeah. yeah. But it's not just brother, is it? There's a lot of family words there. Sister. Sister. Child. Fellow child. Fellow soldier. Right? My son. Right? Okay, well, I heard, I heard another one. Somebody else said another one. It's not a family word, but it's a relationship word. Friend. Friend. Partner. Okay, so I, that's what I was looking for, the fellow, right? We've got a bunch of fellow, right? We've got fellow what? Soldier. we got a fellow soldier. <coughs> worker. We've got a fellow worker. Partner. Okay, well, I'll put partner with it. That's a similar word, right? Fellow prisoner. Fellow prisoner. One more. Friend. Not friend. Yeah, I'm looking for that specific word fellow. Man. Fellow man. You guys see that one? Bottom of paragraph four. Fellow man and brother of the Lord. <coughs> That? Yeah. Hey, what other words do you see? Dear. Dear. And, and I helped you out here because this is where a little Greek is helpful. Uh, the word dear is actually what? Beloved. It's agatapeo in the Greek, which is similar to agape, right? It's got the root agape in it. Do you see another agape in there anywhere? What's the, what's the English word for agape? Do you see any love? Okay, so realize that the word dear and the word love are similar words. Beloved. Love and beloved, right? So love is a repetition. With beloved, and it actually comes up a lot of times, right? Four times in the text, three to four paragraphs. Any other ones? I see one in the second half, but I don't know if it applies or not, but Paul repeats I, 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 I. So pronouns, we're not going to, that's kind of like getting into the weeds a little bit. Okay, okay. 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 so what? Prayer. Prayer, good. Prayer is in two paragraphs. Well, we can see also prayer and praise. And prayer, like, prayer, prayer, prayers, praise, yeah. So in the second paragraph and in the last paragraph, where we're going to see those. All right, what do I want to do? Ah, uh, there's grace in the first and the last paragraph. Yep, there's two of those. Anybody a visual learner? Yeah. yeah. Right? So, what I want to do is, I want to make a, a picture of this book. Six paragraphs, right? So we've got paragraph one, then in verses one through three. We've got four through seven. We've got eight through eleven. We've got twelve through sixteen. We've got seventeen to twenty-one, and then twenty-two to twenty-five. So let's put some of these down and see how it looks. Thank you. 
Christ Jesus Lord impacts the whole book, right? It's, just, it's in every paragraph. It affects every paragraph. Then what about these family words? Brother, sister, father. Brother.
And then a, a similar idea in the third paragraph is the word useful. Okay, just trust me on this. Third paragraph, last sentence of the third paragraph, C says useful both to you and me. Circle useful. Okay, then in the fourth paragraph, there's a word favor. Okay, this is actually in the Greek the same word as good thing in paragraph two. You don't catch it with the English translation. Okay, so I'm not expecting you to catch that one. But circle favor. And then in the fifth paragraph, kind of two-thirds of the way through, circle the word benefit. Where it says that I may have some benefit from you. Okay, those are all similar words, and it's going to actually be a significant thing as we dig into it a little bit. All right, so that's all. That's making observation, right? You guys good with that? Okay. Now, did you see any causation? Remember, what's the flag word for a causation? And then, therefore, Not, so. Therefore, so. Therefore, so. Then. And then, then. sometimes, right? Because. Did you, no, because is a substantiation, we're not going to do that today. Even though there is one in here, just for time's sake. Anybody see any causations in the book? Third paragraph, therefore. Third paragraph, therefore. So I'm going to put a. Alright, I'm going to put the arrow for a causation. Where does the therefore occur? First word of the third paragraph. Remember, where does the flag word happen? Between them. So what does that mean? My cause is. So when it happens at the beginning of a sentence, then the sentence before is the cause and the sentence after is the effect. When it happens at the beginning of a paragraph, what does that mean? What's my cause? The whole, the whole paragraph. So this is a big thought. Right? When an author starts a paragraph with a causation, it's a big thought. We're going to get into, as we get into the books, we're going to see whole segments of books that start with a causation. We're going to say these last 20 paragraphs are the cause, and then these other paragraphs these other 15 paragraphs are the effect. Or when you get to the book of Romans, the book splits in two. And anybody know Romans 12.1? Therefore, Therefore, brethren, I beseech you in view of the mercies of God to present your bodies living sacrifices. That divides the book in half. So the whole first 11 chapters become this massive cause that produces this incredible effect of chapters 12 through 16. Wow. Right? It's just mind-blowing stuff when you dig into it. Okay, so paragraph two is going to be our cause. Paragraph three is going to be our effect. Do you see any more causation? Yeah. Would you consider the very last paragraph where it says, and one thing more, as some, as an and then, or no? No, unfortunately not. It's just one thing more. Well, then otherwise it will be... So. So. So, so, exactly. More. Right? So the fifth paragraph also starts with a causation. So what does that mean for us? It's our cause. It's the whole paragraph. This whole paragraph. What's our effect? This is the next one. Oh, yeah. Right? And then this is our effect. Right? So this is why I say you don't need commentaries, right? Because now you see, oh, this is what causes this. So I can teach people that this should produce this in your life. Simple. Right? No chance for heresy here. <laughs> okay. Now, the uh, last thing we were looking for was what? Contrast. Do we have any contrast? The last one that there Okay, so here's something that I want you to, to look for, okay? 
and I, I, I don't mean this to be crude, but don't take this crude. I only want you to pay attention to big butts. Okay. <laughs> only look for big butts. That's the only thing we're paying attention to are the big butts. And okay. what constitutes a big butt? Capital. Capital. Okay, a capital B. So we're only looking for big butts here. So butts that start sentences or paragraphs. Paragraph 14. Okay, so paragraph 4, everybody see that? Which verse is it? To tell everybody. 14. So the middle of that paragraph, paragraph 4, there is a contrast. Now, for those that are visual, where's all the material headed? Everybody see it? It's all moving me to the last chapter. To here. This is where the dynamite's gonna explode. Right? Paul is moving us. See how the arrows show you? So it's going this direction, and then the effect actually points you to a contrast. Is it verse 14? Verse 14. 14. Oh, I put it in the wrong one. Yeah. Right, so the contrast is going to lead me to the final application. Okay. What question? So yes. is the contrast, is it always going to be cause, contrast, effect? No, it can be it contrast, can be... contrast, 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 contrast. Okay, so no necessary cut. Yeah, we get into Mark. There's going to be a whole, a whole segment where Jesus is just going to go contrast, contrast, contrast. You say, but I say. You've heard, but I say. You've heard, but I say. You've heard, but I say. Heard, but I say. Heard, but I say. Right? It's just going to be one. We're going to be like, ah, oh, I can't take it anymore. Right? Okay? So, we're done with our observation. We have broken down the entire book of Philemon in 30 minutes. Okay. Second step of inductive Bible study, and this is the critical part. So this is the easy part. The critical part is what we call asking good questions, and that's the second step. Asking good questions. Asking good questions. So turn to the person next to you and ask, what kind of questions should you ask? What kind of questions should you ask? Good. Good questions. Hey, Okay, so now, what you should have said is, I don't know, because he hasn't told me what a good question is. So the two types of good questions in inductive Bible study. The first one is factual questions. Factual questions. Okay? This is like, how many times does that word repeat? Or in how many paragraphs does that word repeat? Because what can I give as an answer? A fact. Right? A, an example of a bad question are what we call speculation questions. Why is a question you can never ask in inductive Bible study? Unless Paul says, this is why, right? <laughs> we don't have an answer. Make sense? Why is so difficult to answer. And so we want to stick with, initially with the fact. Okay. The second type of question, this is where it takes some practice and a little bit of art in it, is what we call implication questions. Implication questions. Implication is about what is the significance of this? What does this imply? Right? What can we take away, right? So these are, these are implication questions. Factual questions are what does the word mean? If we're asking a question about the causation, what would be the only factual question we could ask? What is the cause and effect? What's the cause? And what's the effect? Then we want to start there. That make sense? If we're asking a factual question about the contrast, what's the first what's the question we want to ask? What is What two things are being contrasted? That make sense? Okay? Now, when we get to significance questions, it'll be, what's the significance of that? All right, and we'll start asking some of those questions. 
All right. That makes sense? Yes. All right. And then the third step, we're going to do the second and third step together. The third step of inductive Bible study is answering your questions in the context. <clears throat> answering your questions in the context. For us, what's our context today? What's our context today? This is it. This is our context. First Timothy is not our context. Isaiah is not our context. There's and and sometimes I will say sometimes an author will invite you to a broader context by quoting a scripture from another verse. Then they're inviting you to go look at that scripture. Are there any verses quoted in Philemon? No, so where do we have to stay for our answers to be contextual? Philemon. Philemon. Philemon had no other resources that Paul pointed him to for answers. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. This is intended to be understood in its context. So we're going to start in for our, let's start with our, our contrast. What's our, conte our context for this contrast? Our immediate context. But paragraph four. Alright, that's our immediate context. We start there. For this first causation, what's our context? Two and three. Two and three. Right? Because it spans them. That makes sense? So we start there and then we we can expand to the book. Right, but we're going to start with our factual questions. They're always going to be in the immediate context. Okay? The answers are going to be there. All right, so any, any answer that is from your opinion, from another book, from a sermon that you heard, is no longer study. You are no longer study. Because what we want, inductive means I'm going to let the book tell me what it says. I'm not going to bring any ideas to this book. I'm going to try to see it as if I'd never heard it before. Right? Because you'll be amazed at how much you have misunderstood Scripture from its context. Let me give you a quick example, then we'll get into some question asking. What's the first chapter? And then for those of you that have heard me use this analogy, don't blurt it out. Uh, what's the first chapter of Genesis all about? Creation. Creation, right? You open your Bible, what's it going to say? Right there, what's the subtitle going to be? In the beginning. What, what, what's it going to say above it? That they, Genesis. Uh, creation. Creation. Like, we look, like, okay, go ahead and look at your Bible. Put, pull up a Bible or pull it up in your, in your, in your app. Creation. Right? What does it say in the first chapter is all about? Okay, so I want you just to, just to really quickly scan through that first chapter and see how many times the word create, creation, appears. Creation. Genesis. 
Every single one. There's not a single significant attribute of God that is missing from the first chapter of Genesis. It is a complete bio on God. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What was that? Okay, so let's go back to Philemon. I want to, I want to keep us in this context. You ready to start asking some questions? Yeah? You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with repetitions. A factual question for repetitions are which words are most repeated? And what do we decide? Alright, this Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. It's clearly our biggest repetition. There's nothing that, that matches that one, right? So that's our biggest repetition. Okay, so now we understand the biggest repetition in the book. What are some other ones that show up? Right, so we've got this, this family repetition that shows up. Right, it's not as big, but it's pretty significant. Right? Mm -hmm. What are some other things that show up? Koinonia. The whole fellow partner thing, right? That's kind of our next big one. Right? That's kind of as big as the family one. Okay. Right. And then we get prisoner, the whole good, benefit, useful. That one will be about the same size. It'll actually be a little bit bigger when we dig into it, but uh, go for that. Ah, <laughs> teaser. So, uh, another factual question we want to ask about repetitions is what does the word mean? Because I can go to a dictionary and find out. All right. So if you don't know what a word means, like say we were studying First John and you got the word propitiation. <laughs> Like, I have no idea what that word means. What would you do? Look it up. Now, another thing that we have in this book uh, that we didn't point out is we have a lot of names. We have a lot of names. This is the most personal book of the Bible. In fact, it's the only book written to a single individual. Right? Uh, so it's the most personal. Actually, the, the pastoral epistles are as well, but those were intended for. Well, never mind. We'll get to that. Um, so we can go and look and say, what do these names mean? Is there any significance to these names? Right? I don't know. What does my mean? Love one? Nope. You did, yeah. I'm not expecting anyone. Uh, it means to, uh, it means affectionate, affectionate, right? Literally, in the, in the, the Greek is literally the one who kisses, is Philemon. So he's, his name means affection or affectionate, right? Uh, Apophia, and so it's written to his family, right? So Philemon, Apophia is his wife, uh, Archippus is probably his son because it's the church that meets in their house. Right? So he's writing to their family. Uh, Apophia means fruitful. Interesting. Right? In the uh, second verse, also to Apophia. Right? So maybe there's something there. I don't know. Interesting. Archippus means horse master. I don't know if there's anything there. Probably not. <laughs> right? Onesimus. And this is where it gets interesting. And this, is, this should ring some bells in your head. Onesimus, his name means useful. Have we seen that word before? Yes. Paragraph three in the bottom. It's in a It's in paragraph three. Yeah. And I appeal to you for my son in this sense, right? Is so the, the this runaway slave from Philemon? His name means useful. Look what Paul says. After he uses his name formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful. Right? So this 
transformation that's occurred in, on, with Onesimus be, becoming saved. Just for fun, I'll throw this out there. Remember where I said circle the word benefit in paragraph 5? It says that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. That word benefit is Onesis in the Greek. Root word for Onesimus' name. That I may get something useful from you. Okay? All right. So we've asked our questions about our, our factual questions. What's our, our cause in paragraph 2 and 3? What's the cause here? Paragraph one's, or paragraph 2 is the cause. What's the, what's, and what is that cause? Go ahead and read the paragraph. What's the cause? It's a lot. It's a whole paragraph. It's not just one word. <laughs> it's a whole paragraph. It's a lot here. Right? So, his love for all of God's people was one thing, right? And you have another that, thing. You have understanding of every good thing. Understanding of every good thing that Paul's prayer that for a, actually a, for a deepened understanding yeah. of every good thing that they share, right. right? And just just to tease your brain because I'm running out of time. What does Paul want to share with Philemon? Partnership. They got a partnership. Look at the end of verse 3. Look at the end of chapter 3. Look at the end of chapter 3. And you'd become useful. So what, what, under, what deepening understanding does Paul want Philemon to come to about the good things that they share? Onesimus. You see that? You see, I'm praying that as I go through this letter, you're going to understand that Onesimus is somebody valuable that we share. Right now, you don't see it. You don't see him, and you just see him as a runaway slave. You see him as a liability. You see him as a, as a pain point in your life. But I'm praying that you're going to come to this deepening understanding of all the good things we share in Christ, which at the end of the book is going to be Onesimus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I don't want to miss all these cool thoughts that are here. This book is so rich. It's one of the richest books in the New Testament, even though it's one of the shortest. So it's partnership in the faith, this deepening understanding. It's also the way his love has given great joy, encouragement, and refreshment to the heart of God's people. So put that all up in one nutshell. What's the cause? What's Paul talking about? What's he affirming in paragraph 2? Yeah, well, Scott was just talking about who Philemon is. Right? It's, it's just, hey, Philemon, this is who you are. You are someone that loves. You are someone that partners. You are someone that understands. You are someone that has faith. Right? This is who you are. So who Philemon is should produce what effect? Don't look at me, it's in paragraph 3. I've right? never written on you anywhere. We have understanding of every good thing, and that in that place he says that you would, you'd be, or you would do what you ought to do. Yeah. Which is to be useful. Right, so who Philemon is should produce what love Philemon is. That took you to the 
man. No, this is good. This is good. This is good. Uh, let's let's see if our contrast gives us any more insight. All right. Let's see if our we haven't done with our contrast yet. What's the what's being contrasted here in paragraph four? The next paragraph. The what? So he's saying, I'm, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, even though I would like to have kept him. I'm going to send him back, right? But I don't, didn't want to do it. I didn't want to keep Onesimus without you being willing, doing this willingly from your heart. Yeah. Alright, so I don't want to benefit from you by, I don't want you to do something out of obligation to me. I don't want you to do something because you have to. Even though I could have ordered you to do it back in verse 3, in paragraph 3, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to order you. I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love even though I could, even though I have the authority, even though I have the relationship with you just to demand it of you, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it on the basis of love. Is it because he changed his viewpoint from slave to brother, and that's the reason why he's not going from obligatory to now voluntary? Love where your brain's going. You're super close, but we're not at application yet. Oh. So this is where we've got to kind of keep it all in check and, and finish with the questions and answers and then we'll get to the, the significant stuff, okay? So all we know is that Paul's saying, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. I would have kept him, but I don't want to force you to do something out of obligation. Okay? Even though that's my right. Okay? Now, as we start to probe into significance questions, one of the things we can ask ourselves is, is there anyone else in the book who has a similar kind of relationship? Is there anybody else in the book that has a master servant relationship where they could order someone and force them to do stuff. Would that be Paul, Saul, and David? God, in this book. God, God, Jesus. Jesus. Philemon. 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 Philemon and Onesimus. So Paul says, even though I am in the master seat and you are in the servant seat, I'm not going to treat you that way. And now I'm asking you, when Onesimus comes back to you, even though you are in the master seat and he is in the servant seat, I don't want you to treat him that way. And I'm going to model it before I ask him. Is that awesome? Is that awesome? We haven't even got to the awesome stuff yet. All right. <laughs> What is the, and we didn't talk about this because of, of time, but there's something that's called a substantiation, and that's the opposite of a causation. It's an effect supported by the cause, right? And we'll see that with words like because, for this reason, things like that. Is there a for this reason anywhere in paragraph 4? <laughs> Perhaps the reasons or the substantiation for this is what? Okay, what's the reason that Paul isn't going to have this relationship with Philemon as master to servant, and he doesn't want Philemon to have this relationship as master to servant? Because what's possible in this moment? Brother. They would look at him differently. Yeah, there's an opportunity here for a change in relationship. From slave to brother. 
from debtor to family member. Mm -hmm. I'm getting dear to my heart. Yeah. All right. Dear I'm running out of time. So let's just jump right into some, some implication questions. You ready for some implication questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the significance? This is where it really gets exciting. What's the significance of our main repetition that is in every single paragraph? What about that? Is there a one to say? It would be the center of ownership of every conversation that they would have, and that they would have knowledge of exactly the relationship that they have. Right, yeah, so the significance is this is a book about relationships. And all our relationships should be in the context of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, what does the word Christ mean? We didn't dig into all this, but do you know what the word Christ means? Messiah or anointed one. Messiah or anointed one. You know what Jesus' name means? God saves, right? God saves. What does Lord mean? Master, the one that's in control, right? So look what Paul said. All the relationships exist in the context of the anointed one from God who saves and reconciles us back to God and has all the power and control. What's the implication for all our relationships now? That we would no longer be slaves? No. Mm -hmm. As one that we can. If we are in Christ, all our relationships should have reconciliation at the heart. See that? If we're in Christ, because what did he come for? And if we're in Him, and if He, all our relationships are in Him, what has to be at the heart of every relationship? Reconciliation. Reconciliation has to be at the heart of every single relationship. And since Jesus is in the master seat, we don't get to determine or control our relationships. He does. It's not our call. It's His call. It doesn't care what well, he does care, but it doesn't matter whether you want to reconcile or not. It's his call. Alright. What's significant about the emphasis of family relationships? What should our relationships with other believers be like? What should we strive for them to be like? Like a brother. <laughs> Not acquaintances, not ministry, friends, but family, where we belong to each other. And this is one of the most beautiful things that's going to happen over the next nine months. <laughs> you're going to get a family like you may have never experienced before. Now, what's implied? By this causation. Remember what was the cause? <laughs> Who Philemon is should cause him to treat Onesimus as a brother. It's who he is. It's his identity. To not do it is to deny both of their identities. And to not see those relationships as in Christ which is to not see yourself as in Christ. You can't hold on to broken relationships and claim that you're in Christ. That's not who you are. We should have Reconciliation at the heart of all our relationships because it's who we are. We are people of reconciliation. That's who we are. 
We are not people of division. We are not people of rejection. We are not people of unforgiveness. That is not who we are. What's significant about the contrast? Remember it? <coughs> Paul didn't want to force it, didn't want it to be an obligation because what was the other side of the contract? I could force you to reconcile, right, like parents do. Tell your sister you're sorry. So, right? Right? Is that real reconciliation? No. No. Does it change the relationship? No. No, what's on the other side of that contract? A free will choice that results in a transformed relationship. A relationship that was actually better than before the brokenness. Here's the significance. Brokenness, broken relationships are an opportunity for an upgrade. Broken relationships are an opportunity for a better relationship than you could have had before. This, I want you to hear this. This, and this is why this is so important to get. This is the heart of the gospel. That God created us knowing that we would sin. And he had his heart set on reconciliation because before creation, before we were, before the fall, before sin, before brokenness, before the cross, before uh, atonement for sin, before reconciliation, we, mankind did not have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. They were not adopted yet. They weren't family. Family only comes at a brokenness. Because of sin and Jesus' atonement for us, we have the opportunity for a better relationship with God than if mankind had never sinned. Right. That needs to be your heart for everyone else. That before anybody hurts me, betrays me, wounds me, does anything that offends me, without that brokenness, I don't have an opportunity to love them with God's love. In that broken relationship is when I can finally step into the love. And I can finally experience what godly love in relationships is like. If you walk away from everyone that hurts you, you are rejecting the love of God. Amazing stuff, isn't it? Okay. And you guys got it all yourself, which is the cool part. Alright, so a couple more, one more significant thing. But What's the significance of Paul and the last paragraph? The seemingly what we would call what we'll end up calling a nail in the slide. I won't get into that now. What's the interesting thing about this last paragraph? Paul says one more thing. <laughs> Prepare a guest room for me. Because I hope to be restored to an answer to your prayers. What's significant about that? Hard to write these from you. Yeah, yeah. You have to get all the good stuff. You get to visit. You get to fellowship. Yeah, you get a friend. He's sending Onesimus back with this letter. Yeah. He's sending Onesimus back with this message. 
And this was just going to show up the runaway slave that most scholars think stole a bunch of stuff from finally when they hit the road. Onesimus is coming back with his tail between his legs with a letter from Paul. Right? Don't kill me. You know? Don't beat me. Read this first. Right? And he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon for reconciliation. And then he says, and just so you know, I want to come and see you. I want to come and dwell in the middle of that reconciliation. Okay. Now, last significance point, we'll do some wrap-up application. One more significant point about what was our main repetition in this book? Right. We got to mind all the inside out of that. Not even close, right? So I'm gonna give you just one more, right? <clears throat> one more big one. Paul is modeling for us the way the Lord Jesus Christ treats us. Paul is giving us an example of how Jesus treats us. Notice he starts off by saying, I'm praying for you. Jesus intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. He appeals to us on the basis of love rather than his authority. He shares his heart for others with us. And this is important. Think about this. Paul says, I know what your heart is for this, miss, but I want to share with you my heart. That he's my child in the faith. He is useful and valuable to me. He is my very heart. That's how Jesus feels about you. And it's how he feels about the people you have broken relationships with. Jesus doesn't feel the same way towards those people that you do. He has a much different heart. And then he sends us back to reconcile. It's not okay with Jesus that relationships stay broken. And he wants that reconciliation to be done out of free will love, not obligation. Because he wants to give us an opportunity to upgrade that relationship. And he wants us to welcome them in the same way that we would welcome Jesus. And here's the kicker. Notice what Paul tells Philemon about anything that Onesimus owes him. What's he telling him? Paragraph 4, or paragraph 5. It's our, it's our last causation, right? It's our last causation. Charge it to me. Put it on my account. Send me the bill. I'll take care of it. Okay? Think about it this way. If I gave you a million dollars. Okay, imagine I gave you a million dollars and someone stole a hundred dollars from you. And you told me about it. You know, can you believe it? Right? John stole a hundred dollars from me. Right? And I said, you know, I love John. Send me the bill for that. I'll take care of it. What would you say after I've already given you a million dollars? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, right? You're, you're, giving, I don't, you don't, you're not the one that gave me a hundred dollars. Here's the principle. You, Jesus, has already given us so much that his forgiveness covers anything anyone else can take from you. You've been given way more than anyone could ever take. And when someone hurts you, Jesus says, charge it to my account. Charge it to my Let my love and my grace and my forgiveness be what pays that debt. Jesus isn't asking us to dig deep into our own resources to forgive the people that hurt us. He's saying tap into my resources to find the forgiveness and grace of you. That's what the solution is. Jesus has already taken care of 
paid the penalty for whatever sin anyone commits against you. And when someone hurts you, I want you to hear in your head Jesus say, charge that one to me. Charge that one to me, because there's more than enough on my account to cover up. So, what's some application? Let's wrap this up. What's some application for us? Application number one, we need to see all our relationships in the context of Jesus, and reconciliation has to be a part of this. Right. So ask yourself, where am I, where, what relationships am I not seeing as in Jesus? What relationships am I not seeing as in Jesus? In other words, where am I seeing people in the context of their sin and shortcomings? When it's hurt you. So ask yourself, do I have those in my own life? That's the application. Right? Are there relationships where you do not see people in the context of Jesus, and therefore do not have reconciliation at heart. Write those names down. I guarantee you've all got at least one. You may have to go back a little bit, but there's some that you just don't see those people as in Christ. You don't see that relationship as covered by Jesus. Now you know you've got no excuse for that. Because right, Jesus is saying, charge that one to me today. Do you have relationships with other believers that are broken and you no longer see his family? Or you've written them off as not useful anymore, not valuable to me in your life. Do you have any of those relationships? Have you run away from any relationships? Like Onesimus? Maybe you've taken and you feel guilty.
questions? You guys enjoy that process? Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. Enjoy the process. All right, let me pray for us and we'll go grab some lunch. Father, thank you for the richness of your word that just in an hour unpacks so much for us. God, I pray that this wouldn't just change, wouldn't just be the restart of our relationship with other people today as we now go and try to apply these principles of reconciliation. But God, that you would restart our whole relationship with your word. That we'd start to see it differently. We'd start to have a hunger to dig into it. And we trust you for it. Bless our lunch, conversations afterwards in Jesus' name. Amen.